If you open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, we, are, we started a study of the book of Philippians last week. I, inter, I got a chance to introduce a little bit and then ran out of time. And today I'm going to take the whole, the whole first and second sessions uh, to do this. But in verses, uh, we did the salutation and introduced uh, Paul. Uh, Paul uh, is remarking to the congregation, the Philippi church at Philippi, uh, I thank my God in all of my, I'm in verse 3, I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you. Isn't it good to have um, good thoughts? about other people and good thoughts about other people who have ministered to you and you've ministered to them. That's a wonderful thing in the Christian life. Now, not necessarily in the world's life, but in the Christian life, that's a big deal, isn't it? And, uh, and I am thankful that Paul reminds me of that, how thankful you should be for those who have been engaged in your ministry, who have participated in your ministry, and you've participated in theirs. And, and that's what he's talking about here. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And uh, I wanted to focus on verse 4, always offering prayer with joy always offering prayer with joy. And uh, we started last week with that idea, of praying with the joy of God in your heart, praying with the joy of God. That's a place of mem remembrance, isn't it? To pray with, with, with joy in your heart is a, a, a sense of remembering how wonderful God has been to your life, how God has participated in your life to bring you where you are. Uh, and you express that back to him in your prayer of thanksgiving. And what happens in a heart like that is there's joy in your prayer life, joy in your prayer life. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get into our lesson today. But when I was talking about that, I was talking about uh, uh, some experiences I've had, and I've had more of them this week than I had last week, of, of meeting people with anxiety. In fact, I had to face it in my own life, uh, some anxious, anxious moments, and had to dispel them in my own life. And so I, I want to come back with us after a word of prayer, and I want to deal with, we, we, and I want you to turn over there now, Let's go to the fourth chapter. I went last week. I went back because of prayer. I went back uh, to how Paul. Paul. Here was my point. Paul opened the book of Philippians about prayer, and he closed it about prayer. And I believe what he was trying to do with the Philippians was to teach them how important it was to participate with one another in prayer for one another. And so I took us, because I had been running into experiences since COVID, uh, my ministry has been focused on people with anxiety, uh, little bitty children, uh, uh, young, young children with a lot of anxiety. And I meet people who are filled with anxiety and aren't quite sure why they feel that. Some of that's coming off of COVID and shutdowns and all those kind of things. And, but I find Christians with it. And so I felt one of the keys to anxiety is your prayer life. And Paul taught, watch this, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, listen to what Paul, and, and uh, verses six and seven, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so 
I'm going to go back to that subject matter with us a little bit, and then we're going to talk about how to have an effective prayer life. How to have an effective prayer life. So let's, let's stop right here with Ephesians 4, and, and let's have a word of prayer. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour so that he can teach you the word of God so he can recall it to your life. That's really important. The Holy Spirit will teach you the word. He will, he will categorize it and put it in your soul, and he will recall it when it's necessary for your soul. John, Write this down, John 14, 26. John 14, 26. If you haven't memorized that by now, that's a verse you ought to memorize. The Holy Spirit will teach it to you and then recall it. Teach and recall. The Holy Spirit will do that. We've all had that experience when we've needed to recall a, a scripture and say, well, I know that scripture. Where is that? You pause a minute have a word, and have a word of prayer and he'll pop it to you. We've all had that moment in our life when he'll do that for us. And so that's how that works. So we want to be sure today that when you study the Bible, you'll be able to put it in a place, allow the Holy Spirit to put it in a, in, a, in a compartment within your soul that he can recall. It's called your memory center of the heart, the memory center of your heart. And he'll be able to recall it to you. And that's very important. All right. So let's have a word of prayer. Listen, you're, today as you said here, you're either carnal or spiritual. You're saved, but you could either be carnal or spiritual. How would you know if you're carnal? Well, like 1 first, like first Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, you know you're carnal if there's personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin. It could be sin of the tongue. It could be overt sin. But there is, there is an awareness in a Christian that they've committed sin. So what do I do? And that's in carnality. Sin is the evidence of carnality. So what do I do? I confess my sin. I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me. He's faithful and just to forgive me. If I do what? Confess my sin. Right? So you have to, you have to name that sin that has caused carnality in your life that's taking you away from the internal ministry of the Holy Spirit. He hasn't left you. He hasn't left you. He's not going to leave you. He hasn't left you. It's your responsibility to return into the fellowship hour by confession of sin. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just, watch this now, to forgive me and to cleanse me. See, that takes you back to verse 7 and the work of Christ on the cross. Not for salvation, but for sanctification. The, minute, the great ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in your life. So let's have a word of prayer to give you an opportunity through your priesthood to do business with the Lord by confession if necessary. Otherwise, enter your prayer life that God would teach you something today. Would Listen, I've got messages for you that will absolutely put you into transformation. God will transform your life today if you'll listen to my message. I promise you, he will transform your life. He will do the work of transfer and your life, your life, there has to be an exchange made from the world to the word. You've got to give up the, the world for the word. The word has to trumpet. And when you do, transformation is going to take place. The word of God is going to trans transfer and there's going to be a light bulb go off in your heart and, and, and a whole new perspective about your life. That's really important. Let's pray. I give you that moment of silence for preparation, confession of sin if necessary, otherwise into your prayer life. That personal prayer for God, teach me something today that would put me into transformation from the world to Christ. Transfer me. Transfer me, Father, from the way the world thinks to the way the Lord thinks. I want to possess the mind of Christ I want to possess the mind of Christ. And so help me understand that today as the pastor teaches. And so, our Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us in the next two hours. 
I pray the Holy Spirit would do as he has promised. He would do the great work of teaching and recall. I pray, Father, that, that there would be a willingness in our hearts for being transferred from the way the world thinks to the transferred to the way the Lord thinks. This is, what, this is what's happening to the, to the church today in America. We've gone the way of the world. We've gone the way the world thinks and not the way the Lord thinks. We've got to return to the Word of God. We've got to return to transformational thinking. I pray this today would be a starting place for many and, and, and a wonderful experience in our life through the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's what I want to do with you. Notice I wrote in our first study, I want to teach you how to win over anxiety through prayer. I want to teach you how to win over anxiety through prayer. That's what Paul is teaching in Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses six and seven. He's teaching you how to win over anxiety through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer under the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Like, for example, write this down. For example, Romans 8, 26, 27, which we'll talk about in the next hour. All right? How to win. And listen, not how to win once in a while, but to how to win every day. Life itself in the world, life itself creates stress. Just living in the world is stressful. Just being alive in the world. So how do you, how do you deal with the stress so it doesn't turn into anxiety? Because anxiety is a mental attitude sin. Anxiety. And I'll show you, I'm going to show you today what Paul says robs you. What anxiety robs you of in the Christian life. Now watch this. Back to, back to Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, you see, anxiety steals disrupts the peace of God in your heart. It disrupts it. Well, don't you know when you're full of anxiety, you ain't got no peace? I mean, I shouldn't have to explain that to you. And see, anxiety has replaced the peace of, Christ, the peace of God in you. Now look, he says, be anxious for nothing but through prayer. And then he says, and, the, and listen, when you come back to a place of giving it to the Lord, when you give it to the Lord, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and your mind. You got to understand that. You're anxious. When you become anxious for something, right? When you, what's the Bible say? Be anxious for. So when you put something in there, I am anxious about what? You understand? That what has produced anxiety. You, you have, have anxiety over the what, and the what shouldn't even be there. And when it is there, it steals the peace of God from your heart. It disrupts that. It disrupts the peace of God from your heart. And listen, so you want to guard your heart and your mind, right? You want to guard it. You understand that? All right, well, uh, we, we're getting there then. So how do we win over anxiety through prayer in the Christian life? The problem with flesh anxiety, and that's where anxiety comes from, it comes from your flesh. It doesn't come from the Lord, it comes from the flesh. The flesh anxiety in the Christian life, it disrupts what you, what you really need. You've put the what in there. What you really need is the peace of God. The peace of God will take away your anxiety. 
You need the peace of God. You don't need anxiety. You need the peace of God. And, and so look, be anxious for nothing. If you put something in the place of nothing, right? You've gone to the world and not the word. If something, if you've got something you're anxious about, it's the what, you should ask, what's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Well, one would say, don't be anxious. Be anxious for what? Nothing. You go, well, you don't understand. I don't have to understand your case. You're, you're, you're to be anxious for what? You don't have to know it. You don't have to know what you're anxious about. Whatever it is, shouldn't be there. Right? Yeah. It shouldn't be there. What should be there is the peace of God. Where are you going to get that? Write this down. Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Love, joy. Peace. peace. Lo lo love, joy, peace. Where are you going to get that? Where are you going to get that peace? Uh, right on the spot. Where are you going to get it? You're going to get it through the ministry of the Holy You can't get it through the flesh, right? The flesh has produced the what of anxiety. That's what the flesh produces, the what of anxiety. God says there should be nothing in your life that produces anxiety. Nothing. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he will produce what you really need, what you really need is the peace of God. You don't need anxiety. You need the peace of God. And what does the peace of God work off from? It works off from the word of God. What does God say about that? Because whatever you're anxious about, God's got it covered under grace. You see that? Well, so when look on your paper, I've got three points for you about this. When he says be anxious for nothing, that's point one. When he says be anxious for nothing, the word anxious is a command. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, you're going to be anxious. He doesn't say you're never going to get anxious. He says be anxious for nothing. Whatever you think you're, whatever you're saying, well, I'm anxious about this, I'm anxious about that, I'm anxious about this, I'm anxious about that. You're supposed to be anxious for what? Okay. So that's where you start, and it's a command. Start with the idea that your anxiety is, it, is, it, it can't live in my house, right? In the Christian life, in the Christian life, there's no place for anxiety, is there? There's no place for it. Anxiety is of the world. Have you not read John 16, 33? In the world you will have what? Tribulations. You can get away from that. You're gonna, you live in stressful circumstances. It's called the world. You don't buy into what the world says about it. You don't buy into the world system. You buy into the word system. And it's really important you understand this stuff because we live in an anxious society today. It is terrible the way it is. Be anxious, be anxious. Notice that's a present active imperative. That's a command. It's a second person plural. There's not one person in this room I'm not talking to. Not one person in this room. I'm talking to every person in this room that ought to be listening to me, right? That's second person. Second person is Southern, it's y'all. I mean, we should be able to get that one, shouldn't we? See, so the word anxious or worry, don't change the word on me. I, it says anxiety, you go, oh, I, listen, don't change words. Well, I'm just worried. Nope, it's covered under that. Well, I'm just concerned. Nope, it's covered under that. So don't change words on me. Is that people go like, well, I'm not really worried. Uh, well, look, call a spade what it is, all right? So listen, be anxious for nothing. 
The present tense means this is a continuous because of nothing. This is what we call a continuous prohibitive warning. You're not to do this. Oh, oh, Pastor, run. I tell you, stop. Don't want to hear it. I don't mind hearing it, but it's not going to take us anywhere. Because you're you're supposed to be anxious about what? And that's a, that's a standing command of a prohibitive warning. And I don't care what color dress you got at, it's not going to change anything. You didn't have a blue one, don't mean you're blue. A yellow one, don't mean you're yellow. All right? So be anxious for nothing. And this word in the Greek language for nothing means not, not even one thing. Not even one thing. Not even one thing. Now, there's a similar warning given. There's a similar warning given, given which we talked about last week in, in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, where Jesus discussed this very same pro- issue. Don't be anxious over this. Don't be anxious over that. Now, look at it. You know that anytime I give you a number, you always, you always check it. So I wrote down, Jesus asked six, six questions. I went back and looked at it this morning. There are seven. So let's go over there and just take a quick look at that. Because they ask questions. Now, when Jesus asks rhetorical questions, you ought to be paying attention. Because a good teacher wants, wants to do repetitive teaching, doesn't he? Are you listening to me today? Right? So when he asks rhetorical questions on, on a specific subject, he's trying, to, he's trying to zoom in on something in your life. He's trying to catch your attention. Because between one point and the next point, you float off about what you're going to eat for lunch. So these rhetorical questions are a way a teacher kind of brings you back without going, come on, wake up here. Say something like that. So in the sixth chapter of Matthew, if you go through there, like in, uh, I wrote down, I looked at them this morning, so I wrote, wrote them out on a paper. In verse 25, look at verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. There's, our, there's don't be anxious. About your what? About your what? That's a pretty big subject, can't it? <laughs> Your life? I mean, did he not cover it all when he said that? Your life. He said, now I want to talk about anxiety in your life. <laughs> I don't care if it's medical. I don't care if it's financial. I don't care if it's marital. I don't care if it's this or that or this or that. I'm what? What's he tell you? Are you, are you looking at it? All right. Do not be worried about your... And then he, and then he, talks, about, he talks about a few... De- and listen, what he's talking about is details of life. What you eat, what you wear, etc. In verse 25, is there a question mark? Is there a question mark? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. That's a rhetorical question. We, we, in other words, do not be worried about your life. And so he's mentioned a, he's mentioned, mentioned a, a category of the details of life. Then, then he says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. Look, who does that? But who does that? Who sows, who reaps, who gathers? About? Man. But he used birds. Does that not go like, wait, wait a minute. See, I'm a farm kid, so I understand this. They don't do that, but who does do that? Man. The birds don't even do this. You know, and then he te- listen, and he tells you what you should learn from the birds about sowing, reaping, and barning. Barning. That's a new word, isn't it? 
And yet, watch this, here's the doctrinal point. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Question, are you not worth much more than they? What's the answer? Are you worth more than a bird? Well, I don't know. The answer should be yes, shouldn't it? In the eyes of God, you're worth more because he sent his son to die on a cross for mankind. How do I know that I am worth more than a bird? Well, that's a big statement. See, I would hear this goofiness to say, we of the pet people, we understand all this stuff, and I don't know that you're higher of a higher category than the birds. Well, it depends on what kind of bird you're talking about. Think of it. It's just crazy stuff. Are you not? Yes, because, well, listen, God didn't send his son to die on a cross for birds. Are you not worth more? How do I know that I'm worth more? Because he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for my sins, not for the birds. Yeah, that's what people today say, well, that's for the birds. And who of you, by your being worried, can add a single cubic to your life? Is there a question mark there? I said that often. Listen, I have a grandson playing basketball. Six two and his wants to be taller. He's not tall enough. I said, son, it's not about height, it's about skill. I mean, go back and look at Michael Jordan. There are a lot of people. That is, listen, we would have had him 7 1 or something by now. As if, <laughs> if we'd have had him 7 1 or 7 5 or some goofy number. Who by being worried can add a single verse, verse, verse 28? Who can add a, a single hour? Then in verse 28. In verse 28, listen, you can't, you, can't even, you can't even add a single hour to your life. Well, you know, I hear people say to me, there's not an alpha hours in the day. Well, boy, God was asleep when he did that deal, wasn't he? Not enough hours in the day, not enough days in a week, not enough weeks in a month, not enough months in a year. I mean, where, where does it stop, people? Why are you worried about your clothing? Observe how the lilies of the, of the field grow. They, they don't toil and they don't spin, but who does? Man. See, he's talking about us. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon, all his glory, go, go himself like one of these lilies of the flowers. Verse 30. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Verse 31. See, he makes an exclamation in 30. In verse 31, he says, do not worry then. Do not worry then. See, that's a theme. He's going to say that so many times in here, and you still don't get it. See, this is not the first time he said that, has it? Ah, it's his theme. Do not worry then saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for clothing? The Gentiles eager, and there's a question, the, the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will what? What? Be added to you. Verse 34, so in conclusion, what? Do not worry about what? Tomorrow. Watch what he says. For tomorrow will have cares of itself. See, we live one day at what? One day at a time. One hour at a time. <laughs> one minute at a time. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Watch this now. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
If you think there's not going to be trouble tomorrow, wait till today teaches you. Okay? Now look, the theme of that whole message, would you agree, is do not worry. That was the teachings of Jesus to us. Because, listen, God's, get, what? Listen, here's his point. Because my heavenly Father has it. Whatever, whatever you put, don't be anxious about nothing. Whatever you put in the nothing spot, God has it covered. God has it covered. God has it covered. Now, here, here's a point you miss. Do you know how this, you know how Jesus opened this, that teaching up? Go back to verse 25 with me. Because you missed it. You missed it. Look at verse 25. He said, it is for this reason that I say to you, and then he went into this great thing about do not be worried, right? He said, do not be worried. I wrote it down 25 and 27, 31 and 34. Do not worry. It's the theme of what he taught. Do not worry. But watch this. Now watch this. For this reason, I, for this reason is very similar to you when you see the word therefore. It's reaching back to something that he's already said that's important as a backdrop to his teaching. Do you understand that? For this reason, I say to you, and he launched into this Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Agreed? Look what he said in verse 24 that makes all this important. Watch what he said in verse 24. No man, what? Who? No man. Listen, it says no one. That, right? That covers no one. It said, well, you know, it probably covers. Now, no one. No one can serve what? Two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. But he can't serve two. And when he serves one, then there's a, a different relation to the other. Would you agree? If you are serving in one realm, then there's an attitude about the other realm. Would you agree? Thank you. Boy, I'm working today. Take pity on me. I've been sick. <laughs> now watch this. Watch this. He says there are two spheres. There's the God, there's the God sphere, and there's the world sphere. Look how he look how he identifies. Joel, you're gonna love this. This is Joel stuff here. You you cannot serve God, and the old King James said mammon. Right? Yeah, mammon. You know what that is a reference to the details of life that he's about to go into discussion over. You can't serve two masters. Either you're going to serve God or mammon. Mammon re represents the details of life over which we're always getting anxious about that God already has covered. Do you understand that? He already has, God already has your needs covered. That's a done deal. They're covered in the blood of Christ. They, they're through the work of Christ. They're covered. They're covered. Now watch this. You're going to be in one of these two realms, either God or mammon or wealth or details of life. We know that he's talking about details because he talks about them. He said, and then he launches off into this discussion. Look at, never put God under mammons. When you do, you're going to be full of anxiety and nothing good is going to come out of it. Because not, God is not engaged in your life. He's not engaged. You have not allowed him to be engaged. Anxiety says you're not looking to God. 
You're looking to the world. You're, 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 look it. You see, verse 24 is the reason he launched into this whole discussion. You're either, you're either serving as a Christian, you're either serving in one of two realms, and you know by your attitude, if you're full of anxiety, you're in the, you're in the sphere of mammon, of the world. You've gone the world way and not the Lord's way. Do you, do you see that? The church has lost its way. The church has lost its way because nobody's teaching their people how to win over anxiety. You win over anxiety because anxiety is a, is a characteristic of you walking in the flesh and not walking in the spirit. Write this down. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Here's what it says. And then we're, and then we're going to, I'm going to bring this to a summary and we're going to take a short break. Because I know if I was sitting where you are right now, I would need to get up and exercise. I, I would have to get up and move around. So I feel for you today. Here, here I am in five, Galatians 5, says that I say walk by the Spirit. That's a command. That's, that's an imperative. And here's the promise. Here's the promise. You, you, will, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The flesh sets a desire against the Holy Spirit who indwells you and the Spirit against the flesh. These two are in opposition in you so that you may not do the things you please. So you're going to be in one of these two. Hey, listen, if, you're, if, if there's anxiety, that's of the flesh. You're, you're walking in the flesh. Therefore, you're walking according to the world way of thinking. You're in one sphere or the other. You're not, you don't have one foot here and one foot there. You have both feet wherever you are. So that, that's important that you understand that. So here's what I did with Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I discussed the problem, right? Anxiety, right? Is that a problem? It shouldn't be, but it is. when it is, how do we correct it? Here's what he says to do. Here's what he says. Here's the solution. When he says, but in everything, see, we went from nothing to what? We went to everything. Right? We went from that. You see, that's really important because you say, well, probably some things aren't. I shouldn't, you know. But he says, you go from nothing to what? But in everything... By prayer, supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice there are three segments of prayer. There are three parts to prayer. There's prayer, prosukame, which means knowing how to pray to hit the bullseye. I'm going to talk about that second hour. There is what's called a supplements, which with the definite article, te, with desis, is a specific need. It could be your specific needs or others. And you're to do this with what? Listen, you should present your needs to God with what? You know what that is? That's an attitude of gratitude. Because God has been so faithful to your life to get you to where you are, you shouldn't start questioning whether or not he can take care of your needs. Because he's been doing it ever since you came into Christ. Ever since you came into Christ, I don't know what that age was, but he's been taking care of you because he's your heavenly father. And does your heavenly father, if, if earthly parents know how to do that, how much more your heavenly father, right? Come on, people. And so you have supplications. That word supplication, supplications deals with the attitude of gratitude. I am so thankful, Lord, that you are a caring, nurturing God who answers prayers. That's how I think. An attitude of gratitude. 
you bring your needs before God with an attitude of gratitude because he has taken care of all of your needs from point A of salvation to where you are today, and he will do it until the day of Jesus Christ. He is not slack on his promises as people count slackness. And so I de- the word request, itima, watch this now. This is really important, request. Watch this now. The request coming from one not able to meet the specific need to one who is always able. That's what that word request means in the Greek. Did you get that? I know you didn't. That's why I wrote it down. I mean, how do I pray for Ann? Right? In our church. How do we pray for Ann? I mean, I, I can't. I don't, I, I can't take the, the cancer and the treatments and all of that. I can't, I don't have the power over that. But I do have the power of prayer. And I can pray with thanksgiving with an attitude of gratitude about the one that can do that. And I go before him as one who was not able to take care of her specific needs. Listen, if it was a meal, I could take her a meal. You understand that? Could I meet her need? Yeah, but she's in a realm that I can't. I can't do that. But listen, I serve one who can. That's what this word request means. It's one who has got a request to set before God that's bigger than man, maybe bigger than the world, and can take the power of God Almighty. And I present it to him for his work to do and not mine. And I'm going to pray for her to receive health because she's still alive. I'm going to ask for quality of life because she's still alive. I'm going to ask for the things that I would want in my life for her, but I can't solve that big problem, but I can do it to the one who can. Right? That's what this word request means in the Greek. It's a powerful idea. And he says, and let your request be known, be, uh, 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 let your request be known, um, how does he say that? Let your, uh, and let your request be made known to God. Say, let it be known to God. You can make it known to everybody in the world, and they can't do any more than I can do. It's beyond my periphery of, of meeting a need, but I can take it to one. As one who can do it, I bring it to the one who can do it, right, Horton? Absolutely. Isn't that a wonderful idea? There are three parts to your prayer section. And here's one that I get caught often with, Mary. I get caught with this. I get caught with this. And I can come boldly to the throne of God's grace And I can appeal for one who can't do it to one who can do it, and I can leave it at his altar. And what, how comforting is that to me to know that God can take care of that problem of whatever it is I can't. If I could do it, I'd rally my church to do it. But it's not mine. And what are we after? What's the benefit? The benefit is the peace of God. Now, I want you to write this down, and I'm, we're going we're gonna to break. Write this down. See where it says, surpasses all comprehension? What in the world? Do you not ask yourself when you read that, what in the world does that mean? Beyond all comprehension. What is beyond all comprehension? Write this down now. Write this down. Ephesians 3.20. Paul answers it. 
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. According to the power that works within us. Isn't that powerful? See, that's what that means, beyond all comprehension. It's Ephesians 3.20 actively working and out open to do something. Now to him who is able to do, see that's request, and now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. I lay that at the altar of God and I'm thankful that I have the privilege to approach that altar and that I have the confidence to make that prayer and have that prayer answered. And the next hour, I'm going to tell you how, how to have an effective prayer life where you hit the bullseye every time you pray it. You shouldn't have to pray and throw up and hope something sticks. So let's have a word of prayer. The men will take an offering for those who are visiting. This is how we take our offering in our congregational church. And then we'll take a 15-minute break and we'll come back to understand we've learned, we've learned, hopefully, a system of how to win over anxiety. And now we'll talk about how to have an effective prayer life. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Place it in us and then play, bring it out of us, not only for our benefit, for others these great lessons, Father, out of the word of God. I pray for this offering, Father, that it would go to the kingdom's work. We spend as little on ourselves as we can, and we spend most on it reaching the world for Jesus Christ. And that is our desire, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the back of your paper, I suppose, on the back of your paper, is our second lesson. Would you go to Revelation with me for a text? The fifth chapter, verse 10. I've always liked this verse. And uh, it, it deals with the priesthood of believers. And I think one of the reasons I really like it is, is uh, how it's, it's one of those verses you kind of don't expect to find in the book of Revelation. Um, and it comes off from a new song. Uh, a revel revelation. There are several times in the book of Revelation where you find there was a new song. <clears throat> That's a study in itself. Uh, in verse 9, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. You know, there are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Worthy are you to take the book and to break his seals. By the way, we, we're study, we study that on Tuesday at lunch. Worthy are you to take the book and to break his seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, every trung, tongue, every people, and every nation. If you want to know the reality of something like that, you could talk to Jackie and Rick. They both are out there doing that very thing. They're going to what you would call every tribe, every literally, uh, every tongue, every language, people, and nation. And then verse 10, and what, are the, what, what, what is coming out of that missionary work? You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Isn't that something? Well, that's both now and, and later. And, and, but what I want to focus on with you is that prayer is a priesthood function, and I, I want to make my reference to you out of Revelation 5, 9, and 10. Let's have prayer. You know the drill, so I'm not going to go back over it. 
just go into my prayer and you can take care of whatever is necessary in your life. So our Father, we thank you today that as we reassemble for the study of the Word of God, we are going to try to teach a basic acrostics about prayer that would help us to be able to hit the bullseye every time we pray. The bullseye. Not just near the target, but to hit the bullseye. So I'm asking, Father, for the Holy Spirit to really encourage our hearts today about prayer uh, in regard to Uh, the priesthood function in the body of Christ, the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I've got two points and then a poem. No. (laughs) I've got two points and then an acrostic on prayer. It's called FACTS, F-A-C-T-S. In the book of Revelation, among many passages, I just chose that one because I found it to be so unique. Uh, We are told that every believer in the church age, every believer is a priest. And I think one of the disappointments within the body of Christ, the church, as I view it overall, is that this is hardly ever emphasized in the Protestant church. And it's misrepresented in the Catholic church. And that's kind of sad because they take credit for the priest and uh, we don't have any. (laughs) And that nothing could be farther from the truth. We both have them and they're both given as a gift of the grace of God. Every believer in the church age is a believer priest, has a priesthood function to the body of Christ the church. And one of those, one of those is prayer. One of those is prayer. So one of the status, 20 status privileges of a positional truth, the moment you believe the gospel that Jesus died for your sin, was buried and raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into union with Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, and makes you a new person in Christ. Everything that he is, you become, positionally. He's a son, you're a son. He's an heir, you're an heir. He's a priest, you're a priest. And that list goes on, and there there are at least 20. We listed 20 for you just to get you started on it. But priesthood is a very important function in the Christian life, and I'm afraid that we don't spend any time with it. And so I want to spend a little time with it in regard to one thing. We all know about prayer, but maybe the priesthood function, you, you may not realize how God describes it. Now, we learned out of Revelation, the reason I like that text is that it's all based on the worthy is the lamb, isn't it? You remember in verse 9? That, that results in us being a priest in the church age, which is a fun. I'm, I, I'll tell you why I think it's not mentioned much in theology of the church. It's because the devil knows what a great threat it is to the body of Christ. And he's just kind of silenced it. He's just taken it off the board of importance in the church. And we're trying to bring it back to some significant importance. And and we're we're going to start today by telling you how important your priesthood is to prayer and how important prayer is to the body of Christ. So it's one of 20 status privileges of all believers. And therefore, all believers, since, since we have that, all believers should have an effective prayer life. Because prayer is one of the key, fun- not the only one, but it's a key function of the priesthood. Would you agree? Yes. Yes, of course. If you, don't, if you haven't agreed before, you will now. In 1 Peter 2.5 on your paper, under point number one, we, we're called a holy priesthood. Now watch this. 1 Peter 2.5, you also are living stones are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. In other words, one of the characteristics of a functioning church body in the world should be the function of the priesthood. That, that's a, and you hardly ever hear of it. Uh, Romans, another function of the priesthood 
is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. You want to circle that and later go back and read it because it's another function of the priesthood. It's the subject of transformation. It's a priesthood function. And he call, in this passage of 1 Peter 2, 5, he calls us, he calls us the holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. In the same book, 1 Peter 2nd chapter, verse 9, he calls us a royal priesthood. Watch this. You, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that, divine purpose, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, Christ, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right? Now watch this. Let me show you the significance. Let me show you the significance of royal and holy. Let me show you the significance. Holy priesthood, holy priesthood reflects the believer's relationship with God. You understand that? He's holy. It's a holy God, a holy Christ, a holy spirit, a holy Bible. Everything is holy based on who God is. And so when he calls us a holy priesthood, it reflects our relationship with God as our heavenly father. A royal priesthood. This is a priesthood that comes to the altar of God's grace, Hebrews 4, 6 comes to the altar of God's grace any time of the day, any hour of the day, and has access with confidence before God. Isn't that, par isn't that powerful? And so holy represents your personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his son, and the privileges that are connected with it, the, the, the status privileges that are connected with it, so, so that you can come to the throne of God anytime and present your case before whatever to God. So we're a holy priesthood, which reflects our relationship with God. We're called a royal priesthood because it reflects our personal relationship with the Son, who is royalty based off from the kingship program of theology. In other words, the King David, King this, King that, King, right? One day, oh, oh, oh. Jesus Christ comes off the seat of David, the king, right? To be a king of the kingdom, agreed? The Lord of lords and the kings of kings. Therefore, a holy priesthood connects us with this wonderful chain of royalty that, be, that is prophetic in David, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and is part of prophetic future. Agreed? I just laid it out for you. And so this reflects when we call he call when we're called a royal priesthood, it reflects our personal relationship with God the Son and connects us with this royalty that goes all the way back uh, prophetically to David. To the you know, Je Jesus had to be born to the house of David and all that. I'm just telling you why these words are used that are so important. And we, we go like, I don't know what it means, so we skip it, right? Words we don't know, we skip, right? And then it catches up us within the eighth grade or a senior year. <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow. And, and so we took our text from that. Now, let me show you, let me show you, and then we'll go home. Let me show you five things F-A-C-T-S that will give you an effective prayer life. I mean, where you, you hit the bullseye every time. Hit it every time. You should not be praying and not have any confidence your prayer is going to be heard or answered. That day's got to stop in this church. We have to have people that pray and hit that bullseye. 
And when we, when we put prayer requests on the line, we, we have the confidence in the leadership of this church that, that people are going to grab a hold of that and they're going to pray and those prayers are going to be answered. We don't hope so. We don't think so. We know so. Now here they are. F. Here's what, here, here is my take on it. All prayer is addressed to the Father in the name of Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know that Matthew 6, 9. Our Father, right? What a wonderful prayer that was, right? Jesus says, you want to learn how to pray? Here it is. Start with this. Start with the Father. Listen, all prayer starts with the Father because he's the source of the answer. Right? Yes. And so you always your 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 prayer has to be addressed to the Father and it has to be addressed in the name of Jesus Christ. John the 14th chapter in John 14 13 through 15. Let me let me grab that for you 14 13 14. Whatever you ask in my name Jesus is talking that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Right? So we have to pray our Father. We address everything to the Father because he's the absolute authority over everything. If you're going to get the answer to the Father, it's got to be according to his plan. It's got to be according to his will. Right? And so we're going to ask the Father, and we're going to do it in the name of Jesus because Jesus is how we got tapped into the Father. Write this down. John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father. No man. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. And what a privilege it is to know that through the Son I can approach the Father. So, all prayers addressed to the Father in the name of Jesus. Agreed? That's where it all starts. Well, you, you got to have... You got everything. The other day, who knew? But the other day, I sent a bill from Moody to Springville. It took 21 days to get there. I'm going like, where is the Pony Express? <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure 21 days I went and I don't remember any holiday in there so I don't know 21 days I don't know uh, then the A stands for ask you know we already, he already introduced if he asked anything but listen I want you to go to first, first John because there's a word in there I want to grab for you first John 5 even though we had it a moment ago, if you, if you ask anything in my name, we had that. But now we're going to find out what he means by anything. We're going to find out what he means by, if you ask anything in my name, we're going to find out what that means. In 5, 14, 15, watch this word. This is the confidence which we have before God. That this is a confidence, or, or the Son of God. This is a confidence that we have before him. This is a confidence. When you get through with facts, you're going to have confidence. The confidence which we have before him, that if the confidence comes from the word of God, the confidence that if we ask anything, if we ask anything what? According to his will. How do we know his will? The word tells us. We don't get it from a flying pigeon or anything. The Word gives it to us. We certainly get it through the mail. So we get it through. Ask according that this, this is the confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, this, here's our confidence. Watch this now. Here's, here's our confidence. He hears us. One, one. We're, now we're building confidence. Agreed? We're building confidence. Here's the confidence. He hears us, and if we know that he hears us in that whatever we ask, and do we know? Yeah, we know because he just told us. 
is, we, then we know that we have the request which we have asked him, which we have asked from him. Yeah. Well, here's our confidence. If I, uh, here's confidence. If I ask anything according to will, here's my confidence. He will hear us. He will hear me. He will answer. Right? He'll answer. And he'll answer according to his will, just like I prayed it. Yeah? How do I know his will? I go to the word of God. You can't get the will. Right? You could call Horton and get it. But other than that, why? So this is, listen, you got to be able to pray with confidence. And here's the confidence that we have. That if we pray according to his will, hey, Patty, you want to come up here and sit with your husband? Or are you okay? I saw you back there and went, do, do I need to have a talk? I'm not used to seeing that. It, it staggered me for a minute. I went, whoa. But she's dressed up for the 4th of July, so I thought maybe she got lost. Uh, anyhow, enough foolishness. Back to 1 John 5, 14, 15. You got it? Where's our confidence? What's our confidence in? <laughs> As the word of God, the confidence about prayer is what? If we ask anything according to his will, what's the confidence? He hears us and he does it. You know, Horton just got right down to it. He said, Stop that, Ron, and just get to it. We get it. Right? The word C stands for confess. All right? I want you to circle a, a, ver, a verse that you should become very familiar with in your prayer life, Psalm 66, 18. Here's what it says. If I regard iniquity or wickedness or evil, I don't know how your Bible might have translated. If I regard iniquity, if I regard wickedness, if I regard evil, if I regard that which obviously stands against the will of God, the word of God. <laughs> I love you, Horton. I love you, Horton. I love you. If I regard iniquity, right? I'm going to come back to that. If I regard iniquity or wickedness or or evil, that which is that, that which is attacking the word of God in your life, if I regard, see, regard's a very strong word. If I buy into iniquity, if I buy into the way the world thinks and lives, whoo, is that baby ever going to affect my prayer life? Well, we know that though, don't we? <laughs> the last thing you're going to do once you get in sin is pray. Uh, unless he squeezes you pretty good. If I regard wickedness where? In my heart. Not in my mind where I'm thinking about it. It's in my heart where it's residence. See, in your mind is passing through. It's a passing through thought, hopefully, that's passing through. You know, people talk about one, in, one ear in one ear and one out the other. Well, he's talking about a mind. It would be wonderful if you could do that. You've got to dump it out of the heart. If it gets in the heart, you've got to dump it out. It don't go in and out. I mean, you got to dump it out. You got to dump it out. You got to put it off. You got to cast it aside. Oh, my, my. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You want to get into sin and stay in sin and say, I don't care what the Lord, I ain't I don't do my life. It's my life. I hear this so much. It's my life. And, you, you parents hear that? <laughs> it's my life and I'm going to live it any way I want to live it. Well, that, if that was true, I would say go for it. But boy, that's insanity. You can't live your life the way you think you're going to live your life. It don't work that way. Okay, if you want to learn it the hard way, go for it. But it ain't going to work that way, dear heart. It doesn't work that way. 
be stupid. It don't work that way. Listen to the Word of God. Listen, what you want, you're not going to get from the world. Go to God and He's already got a package ready to send. Well, anyhow. So what should I do? I should first John 1 9, I should confess my sin, right? I should confess my sin. And so we tell you that if before you pray, you should confess your sin. You should because you can't reach the throne of God in the flesh. You can only do it in the spirit. If you send to the mail to the world, it stays earthly. To get mail from earth to heaven, it's got to be heavenly. Is that too difficult to understand? I don't think so. I don't think so. So if I, I must not regard iniquity I, or, or wickedness or whatever, I must not regard it in my heart. I need to confess it. I need to confess it. And then, listen, I need to confess. Listen to me now, because this is what we miss in the church, in this church. I need to confess it and then correct it. Confessing my sin through the blood of Christ gets me back to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, that journey that I've taken away from the Holy Spirit, that journey needs to be corrected. You understand that? Because you're not following what the Lord says. You're not walking the walk the Lord wants you to walk. You're walking a walk in the flesh. And that's, pre and that's a predetermined desire in your heart that you have set up. So if you don't want to keep going back to that cycle of old sin patterns of the former way of life, you're going to have to correct that. Whatever's pulling you back off from the walk with God to the walk in the world, you got to give that baby up. And you got to do it by grace and you got to do it by the power of God. You can't do it by willpower. You have to do it by spiritual power. Confession of sin brings you to a place where you've got to correct that pattern in your life. Most of this is a pattern. Why do you always get angry? Why do you always get jealous? Why do you always do this? Why do you always do that? It's a pattern that has to be broken. Confession puts you back with the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can take you into transformation where there can be an exchange made from the world's view to the Lord's view. Well, sometime read Romans, the first chapter, and look for the word exchange. So, uh, I gave you a couple other passages well worth your read under confess. Uh, Thanksgiving, the attitude of gratitude, uh, I covered pretty well in the first hour. And then praying, the, my final point is praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. I'm right here in John, so I'm going to flash back or go forward to, Ju to Jude 20. Look at verse 19. Out of verse 18, he's talking about people that are, uh, are uh, after their own ungodly lust. And then he describes them as div divisive, and worldly minded and devoid of the Spirit as unbelievers. But you, beloved, who have the indwelling Holy Spirit, building yourself up on your most holy faith, Word of God, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, what he's referring to is praying by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the mail carrier from earth to heaven. Is that you want your prayer to get to heaven? If it stays on earth, it's not going to get answered. <laughs> no, but not, not by your prayer. Right? Not by yours. So that's you 20. Be beloved, uh, building up yourself on your most holy faith. That's the faith cycle working in your life, praying in the Holy Spirit. It don't mean into some kind of regiment. It means praying under the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you why. 
Here's an answer to that. You say, well, pastor, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. Turn to Romans in your Bible. Turn to Romans or your cell phone or whatever you have. Austin has taught me to be respectful of a cell phone. <laughs> or, the, or the, what do you call that thing you carry? A tablet or the tablet. See, when I think of tablet, I think I got to take a glass of water and drink it. So it's a whole different world, isn't it? Are we in Romans 8, 26? Romans 8, 26. We're going to look at 26, 27, and 28. I think I said 26, 27, but it should be 8. Uh, in verse 27, because he said in the same way, so that means we have to know what he just said. And he's been talking about hope in verse 24, 25. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For he who hopes for what is already sees. That was a question. If, but if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. In the same way. Isn't that interesting? See, you always watch these little things because they're bridges. See, there was a little idea that says you got to go back because we're in a bridge idea. So that's a bridge idea. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. That's true in some cases, right? In other words, we, we may know that we're supposed to pray according to the will of God, but we don't know how that's really going to work out. We don't know how God is going to actually do that. But we do believe he's going to do that. We don't know how, how, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit, watch this now, for, but the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Right. Here he is in your life with your feet on earth, and he's groaning at the throne of God on behalf of your prayer. I don't know if it's what you pray or what. No, what he's doing is interceding. Watch, he tells you what this groaning is doing. What is it doing? He tells you what it's doing. Interceding. But the Holy Spirit himself interceding, interceding with groaning, with words that would be grunt sounds to you but with clarity of what's meaning to the Father. If you heard the Holy Spirit doing it, you would give somebody grunting, groaning. Too deep for words, right? He's talking about human expression. Too deep for words, talking about human expression. I dealt with that earlier about uh, comprehension. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. I mean, here's the Holy Spirit. He's trying to bring the Father, trying to bring clarity to the Father about what the request is all about. Trying to bring it into continuity with the will of God. And the person is struggling with that idea. And the job of the Holy Spirit under priesthood function, under the priesthood function, is to clear it up. He, he clears the, the mail up before it gets to the throne so that it has clarity with God's will. Yeah. He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. In other words, God and the Holy Spirit are on the same page. The Spirit, however, is groaning by interpreting what the person is saying so that it can be, with clarity, the will of God. Does that make sense to you? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to explain it more. Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know what i And watch this. Watch this. The English italicized the will of God. 
See that, Joel? They do it in your Bible? Yeah. He intercedes for the saints. So we, we understand what he's interceding for with groaning. You, right? I mean, I, I told you that, but you go like, where do you get that? So I'm telling you where I got it. Now, watch, watch the result to your life. Watch this now. Here's how it should affect your life. Watch this now. You always quote this verse and it's out of context. Put it in context. Verse 28. And we know that God causes... See, that's in response to the prayer, right? In response to the prayer that you were going to... You, 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 I don't know. I'm just struggling with this. What, well, how to get the will of God? And then the Holy Spirit says, calm down. I got it. I got it. Just calm down. I got it. And he, he finally... Deciphers out what he was really trying to say about the will of God, right? Well, this is groaning to get the will of God, and we know that God causes, and we know, that, and now we want a response, and we know that God. Now here's a response you and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Watch the word to co to those. He uses this twice. Now you miss this stuff, but you shouldn't. To those who love God, to those who call, are called according to his divine plan. His purpose or divine plan. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's how, that's how, that's how Romans 8, 28 works. Off from prayer. The intercessory prayer. Oh, wait, I have an That well, I did the S. I did. There's a little home study for you, just a little bonus. Because I'm done. But there is a bonus. Jesus taught on the importance of prayer in a parable called the unjust judge. In Luke, the 18th chapter, 1 through 8, you should really read that and pay attention to my outline. Pay attention to my outline. And always pay attention if Jesus asks questions. Because <laughs> he's trying to make a point. All right? A uh, little bit of homework to help you understand the importance of prayer. I want you to be able to have an effective prayer life. I want you to have an effective prayer life. Uh, we need that. I, I get, we get calls from all over the United States and foreign countries to, for us to pray for them. Something's, something's working. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way and studied with us so diligently. What, 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 what a, a wonderful class you've given me today. I'm so thankful for that. The health and the strength. I pray for those who are sick in the congregation. I lift them before you, Father. I lift them to you even now. I heal them towards your quality of life. Touch their life as they go through this experience of suffering. For whatever reason, it is for sure this one, that God has not left them, that God is right with them. I will never leave you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He sits by your bedside. If no one else does, he does. And that this is in your life for a divine purpose. It may be testing. It may be for growth. It may be for correction. It may be for a lot of things. But it's to bring you back into some place in your life of spiritual reality. That God has it, if for no other reason, that God has it covered. All of your needs, I have this is a good thing that's happening to you, not a bad thing. Embrace it for the journey. Embrace it for the journey. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see, Rick, if you will help us out of here. We'll pledge our flag. It still stands for freedom and truth, people. Come to attention. Salute. Pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America.
and his true republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.